Journal of Himalayan Studies from 2013 to 2017. For over 20 years, his regional focus has been the Himalayan region, particularly Nepal, northern India, and Bhutan, and more recently, the Pacific North, Northwest, which is why the lecture. He's the author of a number of books, which I've not read up because you've seen the notice anyway. Uh, he is also preached at uh, Mark today. Uh, welcome, Mark, and uh, please. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, uh, good evening. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I know how busy you all are. And I'm also quite well aware of the pressures of getting across this uh, complex city. So it means a great deal that you've given me your time this evening. I'm honored by your presence and I will do my best to make your journey worthwhile. It's really a pleasure to see a number of very familiar faces, uh, the opportunity to reconnect with some colleagues and also to make new friends. And I'd like to thank Deepak Papa and all of the staff at the Social Science Baha for inviting me to give this lecture. And also, I'd like to thank those at Yala Maya Kendra who've uh, welcomed us here and made this location available to us this evening. Not only have I had the pleasure of speaking here before and attending many a very stimulating lecture, but this location actually has quite a special place in my heart also. Uh, Dr. Sarah Schneiderman, who many of you will know, thanks to her work on the Himalayan region, uh, and I got married here 14 years ago, uh, this month. So this place is a space of both intellectual stimulation but also personal happiness, and I'm happy to be back again. So I've worked and lived in Nepal um, on and off since 1991, and I've had the privilege of learning about many different parts of this country through a range of different engagements over time. As uh, Deepak just said, since 2014, I've been teaching at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and I was hired to serve as the new chair of the First Nations and Endangered Languages program. Over these last four years in Canada, I've often thought about how to explain the compelling indigenous resurgence that I see around me in my colleagues, in my students, and in the communities with whom I work in Canada. How I'd explain that to you, my friends and mentors and colleagues and students in Nepal. And this evening is my first attempt at doing so. So we know that many academics uh, preface their talks by saying they're presenting work in progress. That's not my disclaimer. Rather, what I'm offering you this evening is understanding in progress, perhaps even a kind of explanation in progress. And I welcome your questions and your thoughts at the end of this lecture. So I'm going to structure my talk in four parts. I'll touch on territorial acknowledgments, what they are, naming and renaming practices, land and resources, and then finally conclude with academic community partnerships. My aim is not to be comprehensive, but rather to be illustrative and suggestive. Sometimes, as I outline approaches and engagements in Canada, I will draw an explicit link to something in Nepal. At other times, I will intentionally leave that to you. I humbly ask whether you can build a bridge to what I'm saying. Both Canada and Nepal are dynamic, fast-growing, multicultural, federal democracies with significant indigenous populations. That alone is worth noting and perhaps makes a comparison worthwhile. As a visitor to Nepal, and a foreign friend of this beautiful country, it's not my role to be prescriptive. Rather, this talk will be resolutely descriptive, and I hope to raise some questions and perhaps opportunities. Before I turn to the first part, territorial acknowledgements, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. Because before we talk about anything else when it comes to Canada, we need to talk about colonialism. And within that, a very specific form of colonialism, namely settler colonialism. <coughs> this is the original sin of Australia, of New Zealand, of the United States, and of Canada. And this is the kind of working definition that I've cobbled together of what makes settler colonialism, settler colonialism. 
It's a form of colonization and colonialism that seeks to replace the original and indigenous population of the territory with a new and invasive society of uninvited settlers. The structural violence on which the Canadian state was founded was brought right open last year while we were living there in 2017 when Canada celebrated its 150th birthday. It was a massive outpouring of, generally mild-mannered because it's Canada, exuberance celebrating the nation and marking the sesquicentennial of Canadian Confederation. Yet, 2017, which marked 150 years since the passage of the British North America Act, which established Confederation, was also a moment that for vast numbers of Canadians was either totally irrelevant or more seriously damaging and hurtful. For many, Canada 150, as the brand came to be known, celebrated 150 years of officially sanctioned settler colonialism, of violence and of erasure. So 2017 ended up being a year of contrasts. In Canada, it was marked by as much resistance as it was celebration. And not only by indigenous communities and their allies who were very active on social media, which is why I've been so active on Twitter, is to follow all of these people, and they're very skilled at communicating um, their ideas through a good meme. And here's a good one. Canada won 50 years, question mark, Heltzuk, who are one of Canada's many First Nations indigenous communities, uh, 14,000 years, according to the most recent archaeological data that dates them and their ancestors to that territory. So we see here this kind of counter hashtag image. Cities, universities, schools and public servants all rose up in resistance to the idea of celebrating Canada 150. There was a collective voice which garnered considerable national and also international attention. Living through this moment, I couldn't help but think back to Nepal, to moments of national celebration and also national reckoning, and in particular to a piece of enduring writing by Dr. Mary Deshain that has impressively withstood the test of time through all of Nepal's recent political turmoil and social upheaval. It was published in Studies in Nepali History and Society in 2007 and was entitled very simply, Is Nepal in South Asia? The Condition of Non-Post-Coloniality. Dr. Deshane makes a lot of important points in this paper, but the one that I want to focus on in the context of this evening's talk is this idea, and I read it out for you, that the condition of non-post-coloniality has not been taken seriously as a formative aspect of Nepali history. In other words, if Nepal has never been colonized, can it ever really be decolonized? While some in the Adivasi Janjati community will certainly take issue with the proposal that Nepal was never colonized and would strongly argue otherwise. <laughs> Nepal is generally perceived and described in both academic and pedagogical literature as never having been occupied by an outside imperial nation, and therefore occupying a rather unusual position in the wider region of South Asia. So whatever your position is on this matter, and while Nepal is certainly not an Anglo-settler colonial society in the mold of Canada or the US, the Nepali state has, for centuries, perpetuated the systematic repression of indigenous and other marginalized communities through institutionalized power structures that have exploited lands and resources from those people. Some have referred to this process as internal colonization. The domestic domination of the cultures of the citizens of one country by its own elites, a process that was given authority by legislation that defined structural inequalities and subordination, whether political, economic, and social, between peoples within one country. And I won't continue on this theme for much longer in the interest of time, but I believe that it's important and perhaps helpful 
as I talk this evening, that you bear these two kinds of colonialism in mind. Canadian settler colonialism, and what we might refer to in Nepal as a form of internal <coughs> colonization. These are both forms of oppression, quite different, but also strangely intersecting. So let me turn to territorial acknowledgments. This is the University of British Columbia, UBC. It's built on a promontory or spit that pushes into the western segment of uh, Vancouver. It's surrounded on three sides by the Pacific Ocean. It's a massive university campus with over 55,000 students, 15,000 faculty, and impressive libraries, museums, and medical facilities. It's also a very new university by the standards of the old world. It just celebrated two years ago its 100th birthday. And for those of us who live there, it's also a pretty much a constant construction site. My colleague, Dr. Link Kessler, the former senior advisor to the UBC president on indigenous affairs, likes to say that UBC used to be a campus where you would see eagles, but now you're more likely to see cranes. <laughs> UBC was built without permission on the traditional homeland of the Musqueam people, whose ancestors have lived on those territories for thousands of years, according to the archaeological record, and who, despite the aftershocks of settler colonialism, and despite being increasingly restricted and then confined to a tiny reserve halfway to Vancouver Airport, continue to this day to practice their thriving and living culture. The Crown never purchased the land from the Musqueam people. When UBC was established, the land was taken over with no compensation to the nation. To this day, my university does not pay rent. And over the last 20 years, there's been a growing realization and a deepening appreciation of the fundamental and foundational outrage on which the university that I teach at is built. A university that through federal and provincial legislation ensured that any indigenous person who came to that university and got a degree automatically lost their status as an indigenous person. Until relatively recently, UBC was not eager to admit indigenous students. This realization has culminated in a very high profile and now, I would argue, inescapable territorial acknowledgement, which all official visitors to UBC are greeted with at public events. UBC Point Grey Campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. In fact, unceded is a word I'd like to talk about. What does that acknowledgement do? Why do we say it, and how does it help? Unceded was not a word that I was very familiar with before I came to Vancouver. And I hazard a guess that not many here will be that familiar with it either. So let me take a moment to unpack it for you. Unceded refers to land that has never been sold, it's never been bartered, it's never been given away, transacted or lost in war or relinquished in any way. Unceded means that Aboriginal title, which means the deep, enduring indigenous right to the land, has neither been surrendered nor acquired by the Crown. Simply put, unceded means that a community have never relinquished, never given up their land to the government by treaty or otherwise. The University of British Columbia now has official brand guidelines about how you should acknowledge Musqueam. When you go to the website, you can download PDFs that tell students and faculty and visitors how they should appropriately and correctly reflect this deepened territorial understanding. So what's really going on here, and why do we do it? I mentioned already Dr. Link Kessler. He's just retired from his position as senior advisor to the president. Dr. Kessler says, we do this because the acknowledgement begins to restore a bit more balance, in which the functional space of the university is a place where we can have discussions based on mutuality and respect, 
There's a lot in these simple words of acknowledgement. And he goes on to say that the simplest thing we're doing with an acknowledgement like this is showing that there are still people here and that we have a relationship with them and that we're not going to erase that and be silent about it. My colleague, Dr. Daniel Heath Justice, who's an indigenous scholar of Cherokee descent, writes this, most of us are not invited guests. We are visitors, maybe we're invaders. A lot of people want to do the acknowledgement because they are grateful, because they want to be respectful. Let that gratitude shape the acknowledgement. Let it live in the acknowledgement. All of this got me thinking about what it would be and under what conditions it might be appropriate to consider some form of land acknowledgement at Claiborne University, a site of learning and teaching since 1959 that moved its main offices, as I understand it, to Kirtipur in 1967. Kirtipur, a beautiful walled city and center of Noir civilization for close to a thousand years. Kirtipur, the site of a particularly gruesome battle in 1767 when the Gorkali king, Prithinaran Shah, not only succeeded in annexing the historic city on his third attempt, but also enraged by his losses and by the resistance the Kirtipur citizens put up, ordered not only execution, but also the disfigurement of many of the citizens of Kirtipur, cutting off noses and lips of anybody above the age of 13. So yes, it's different here. And maybe the land on which TU was built was bought, or was <coughs> gifted by local landowners, and maybe TU pays rent. Let me be very clear. I am not suggesting, nor am I recommending, nor am I proposing that Nepal start developing territorial acknowledgements along the lines of the Canadian state. To do so would be a very strange form of intellectual arrogance, assuming that the norms and practices of one culture in one country map onto something quite different thousands of miles away. Yet, having said that, at the most basic level, it strikes me that acknowledging and learning from the past helps us not only to live in the present, but also plan for the future. Knowing the land beneath our feet, as one UBC-led initiative is called, how we came to be here, how we came to work here, and understanding the painful and complex history of the territory is an important thing to do. As Dr. Justice so powerfully concluded, all of this would be a way to acknowledge our relationships and the responsibilities we have in engaging one another in more ethical, more responsible, and more respectful ways. So I'm now gonna to turn to names and naming practices, both in Canada and also in Nepal. As we all know, naming is a powerful and political process. In terms of who gets to give the name, who bestows it, what name is given, and even which script it's written in. In Canada and Nepal, the state, through its administration and educational systems, has for decades systematically and consistently overwritten indigenous and local names. Whether these be personal names, ethnic names or place names, often known as toponyms. For Nepal, this has been very well documented by anyone who's witnessed children from different communities coming to school with names perhaps like Pasan or Tashi, only to be renamed by the teachers as Ram and Sita. It's also been noted by Professor Mahendra Lawati, who I believe joins us here this evening, a political science professor at Western Michigan University, that Indigenous names of rivers, mountains, and places have been annexed by the dominant culture. Dr. Lawati goes on to say, with such annexation, historic and social meanings attached to such names have been lost, contributing to the systematic elimination of indigenous culture. About 30,000 of Canada's 350,000 place names have indigenous origins, including that of the country itself. The word Canada comes from the Iroquoian word Kanata, meaning village. As indigenous voices grow in strength, maps are being rewritten. 
Justin Trudeau, Canada's Prime Minister, has promised to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which acknowledges their right to keep Indigenous names for communities and for places. The Economist noted, just earlier this year, that more than 600 Indigenous place names were added to the National Registry in Canada in 2017, compared with only 358 the year before. Canada is internationally celebrated for its federally mandated bilingualism, where massive resources are devoted to supporting and maintaining both English and French, the two only official languages of the nation, and both of them the languages that are not originally from the nation. They are both settler colonial languages. According to national directives, all Government of Canada signs must conform to these requirements, and the text must be displayed side by side in equal size. So where does this leave indigenous place names and signs in indigenous languages? Well, increasingly, communities are taking the matter into their own hands, at municipal, at provincial, and even local levels, creating a level of symbolic and semantic visibility for the languages and peoples who've been on these lands for thousands of years. As Paul Axelrod of York University Canada has noted, the naming of buildings and memorials is a very political process, and there's nothing particularly sacred about it. Decisions about what to name arise from successful lobbying efforts by supporters, or in the case of removing names from buildings and memorials, successful lobbying by opponents of historical individuals. The political motivation of naming the name heightens awareness and sustained public attention about Canada's poor historical relationship with Indigenous peoples. But, as Axel Rod concludes, lots of people are now asking, instead of engaging in these symbolic practices of renaming buildings, why not take real action to improve Indigenous lives? I am sympathetic to the critique. My simple response is, let's do both. John MacDonald was the first Prime Minister of Canada. He served 19 years in that role in two separate terms. <laughs> While he built the country, according to Dr. James Datchuk, an assistant professor of history at the University of Regina, MacDonald decided that indigenous people did not have a place in Canada. They were disposable. In the Indian residential school system, which you see here on the right, which he helped design, indigenous children were removed from their families, from their cultures, and from their traditions. Yet, John MacDonald has been lionized as a national hero, and he's lent his name to at least 13 government schools across Canada. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario is now pushing to remove his name from a handful of schools across the province. A statement from this federation, and I quote, noted that, using McDonald's name creates an unsafe environment for children and an unsafe environment for study because of his role as the architect of the genocide against Canada's indigenous peoples. Lest anyone here think that the process of renaming places is a form of historical revisionism, overwriting history in sort of pointless and symbolic ways that are often motivated by now that most damning of right-wing insults, political correctness, we need to look no further than old Europe to find so many examples of precisely the same process. We may think of the city known variously in the course of a hundred years as Petrograd, Leningrad, and St. Petersburg, or the more ubiquitous Adolf Hitlerstrasse that were hastily removed and renamed after the conclusion of the Second World War to show how powerfully it is that history is written by the winners and it's rewritten by the winners. Names matter. The city of Vancouver in which I live is going through a spate of high-profile namings and renamings from the new Strathcona branch of the Vancouver Public Library, which was gifted a Musqueam place name, which means we are stronger together, 
through a consultation process, as well as the Langara College, a well-regarded local college, which in 2016 was gifted a Musqueam name, meaning House of Teachings. In addition to just recently, last month, indigenous place names for the main square in downtown Vancouver. Each of these complete with a video and audio clip about how to pronounce these words. This is a powerful contemporary movement that's working to rewrite and rename the landscape, bringing indigenous visibility and presence to these otherwise very white settler spaces. My own university has not only received Musqueam names for three student residences, the most recent of which is Tsesnam, the name of an ancestral village for the Musqueam people and gifted to UBC in 2017, but has also just introduced bilingual signage across the whole campus. And no, not in English and French, which would be federally mandated, but rather in English and in Honkaminam, the ancestral Musqueam language. These signs have been installed in 54 locations across the UBC campus, alongside their English counterparts. The names chosen by the Musqueam people do not refer to traditional sites as such, but rather reflect campus geography and directionality. The Hunkaminam language uses a place-based directional system, which refers to the land and the flow of water in other words, place names are upriver, downriver, inland, towards the mountains, towards the shore, not cardinal directions such as north, east, south, and west. So through the installation of these signs, the University Central Planning Department is working to both educate the wider community about the ways we perceive place and understand territory, but also underscoring that names have important symbolic and practical function. They serve as acknowledgments of the linguistic heritage of the land on which the university is built. Nepal boasts many similar achievements, but we must also remember that place names in Nepal, at least many of them, have been heavily Sanskritized for very long. We need look no further than the Kathmandu Valley. Think of Kastamandap, think of Kantipur, and think of Kathmandu. Ancient names are not necessarily indigenous names. What would we need to see to happen for welcome signs to ye, yele, kifu, kwape? Perhaps more critical than all of this, and very much of the moment here in Nepal, is the vexed question of what to call your seven new federal provinces. Admittedly, simple numbers have a reassuring, if somewhat sterile, anonymity even if they strangely echo the administrative classifications of yesteryear, like Purva Eknambur, that the more seasoned members of this audience will recall. While Nepal works through how to uphold diversity and reflect inclusivity in its new federal formation, Canada is asking itself the very same question. Thanks in part to a challenge laid down by indigenous artist Lawrence Paul Eucalyptus of Coast Salish and Okanagan descent, whose recent exhibit at the Museum of Anthropology at my university asked a very simple question. Why on earth is British Columbia still called British Columbia? <laughs> this in turn has led to a very high profile campaign to consider other alternatives, from the rational to the ridiculous, but it's engaged the state the youth and the media in very interesting discussion around presenting alternatives. Why is this happening in Canada at this time? Are we witnessing a huge outpouring of white guilt, or rather a sincere commitment to reconciliation with indigenous communities? To my mind, there's something quite expedient and opportunistic going on. It's really all about land. And it's to land and resources that I will now turn. For the Crown, the principle of treaty making with indigenous people was outlined by the King George III 
in his Royal Proclamation of 1763. That established the constitutional foundation of Canada after the government of France withdrew all of its claims to North American territory. The numbered treaty, we see here a scan of treaty number nine, the James Bay Treaty, are a series of 11 treaties signed between indigenous peoples in Canada, or First Nations, and the reigning monarch of the time. These agreements were created to allow the Canadian government to pursue settlement and further resource extraction in the affected areas. And the treaties provided the Dominion of Canada large amounts of land in exchange for promises made to indigenous people in that area. The treaties came in two ways. Numbers one through seven were from 1871 to 1877, and the last, eight through 11, from 1899 all the way through to 1921. That red oval you see is British Columbia. In the first wave, the treaties were really designed to advance European settlement in the prairie regions, as well as develop the railway. In the second wave, resource extraction was the main motive for government officials. And you'll note that where that red oval is, is a blank slate in terms of treaty. There are almost no treaties in British Columbia. And it is in those non-treaty territories that land is up for negotiation. In December 1997, in what came to be known as the Delgamuk versus British Columbia decision, the Supreme Court of Canada made a groundbreaking ruling. The title and rights of the Gitsan and the Wet'suwet'en people had not been extinguished by British Columbia. This watershed case came bundled together with various other parts of legislation that recognized indigenous rights and outlined a clear sum of those parts. Indigenous rights and title had not been extinguished by the province. Title involves a real, tangible, and contemporary economic interest in the land. And indigenous title means that the owners of the land can decide what to do with it. During the trial, and you see here Del Gamuk himself, during the trial, elders from the community testified in their own languages. While previously anthropologists and archaeologists and other social scientists had served as expert witnesses, in this seminal case, oral history testimony was allowed in the Supreme Court of Canada, and it made a transformative difference. In 1983, the provincial government issued a license to a company, Carrier Lumber, to clear cut trees in traditional Tilkotin territory. The Tilkotin people stopped this with a blockade. The dispute ended up in the courts, first with one chief and then later another chief, Roger William, who, on behalf of the Hini Getwin community within the Tilkotin nation, sought a declaration of Aboriginal title and rights. After years of legal proceedings, in June 2014, the month before I moved to Canada, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, agreed with the Tilkotin in a landmark decision, and it established their indigenous title for their First Nation, with huge impact beyond the specifics of that case. As a result of that momentous decision, Canadian provinces and territories cannot claim a right to engage in clear-cutting logging, or for that matter, resource extraction and pipelines, on lands protected by Aboriginal title. They must gain approval for such action from the title holders before proceeding. While the court <coughs> fell short of instructing the government that it must seek consent in all cases, it did caution the government and industry that they proceed without consent at their own peril. These rulings have altered the course of Canadian history. Governments change, Supreme Court rulings stick. For years, the lack of treaty has implicitly benefited the Crown. More recently, after these and other landmark and transformative legal rulings, the benefits of the absence of treaty may rather accrue to indigenous people. I will leave it for you to consider the implications of these rulings in the context of Nepal 
where historical land ownership is so very different. Although I will point, I do so with this slide, to the central importance of Supreme Court rulings in generating the legislative conditions for an inclusive and multicultural democracy. That itself is a point of comparison. Finally, I'm going to reflect briefly on how academic and community partnerships work in Canada <coughs> in general and also specifically at my university with a view to thinking about what kinds of modalities might emerge in Nepal in this fast-growing higher education sector. I should add that I believe the imperative for the profound realignments in the universities that I'm going to share with you stem from a culmination of all of these different issues I've mentioned already and a deep strategic imperative to engage with Indigenous partners. So let's start with this. A powerful statement by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. This is a Canadian federal body, a funding agency that promotes and supports post-secondary research and training in the humanities and social sciences. It's one of three major federal granting agencies that fund the work we do, and it's an absolutely central body for our professional development. The council has made a very strong position on what it considers fundable research that involves indigenous people. And these very subtle changes of preposition can have a lasting and profound impact. I'd like to read out this paragraph for those at the back. Those who conduct aboriginal or indigenous research while coming from diverse cultural traditions are committed to respectful research involving both <coughs> aboriginal and non-aboriginal perspectives. And here's the key. This understanding of Aboriginal research represents a shift away from research on and for Aboriginal peoples to research by and with. Those tiny realignments do a huge amount of work, and I think they're really important to understand. Many Canadian universities, and my own included, are now developing strategic plans that are not only focused on indigenous partnerships, but increasingly making space for indigenous-led research that is collaborative, cooperative, consultative, and co-developed. So our university released their strategic plan a month ago. There are eight points, and one of them is, and I'll read it out, to partner with indigenous communities on and off campus to address the legacy of colonialism and co-develop knowledge and relationships. Many of these partnerships between First Nations, indigenous groups, and local authorities or schools are based on protocol agreements, memoranda of understanding and agreement that outline a series of expectations and responsibilities that are foundational to a sustained relationship. And I think this is very important in this context because treaty making, at least from the perspective of the Crown and the state, was really about limiting relations and restricting claims. It was widely perceived that through treaty, indigenous communities were basically given a final divorce settlement. Protocol agreements and high-level memoranda of understanding and affiliation are in fact designed to create and nurture relations. It's more like entering into a marriage than a divorce. This is one of those memoranda of affiliation at UBC, the most foundational one, with the Musqueam First Nation. Senator Murray Sinclair, himself an indigenous lawyer by training, served as the chief commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was organized by the parties of the Indian Residential School Settlement. The commission was established in 2008 with the purpose of documenting the history and the impact of the Indian Residential School System and it provided those involved, both the survivors and the administrators, with a way to share their experiences during public and private testimony across the country. In June 2015, the committee released its calls to action, 94 points that our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has committed to implementing each one of. Many of them relate to universities. Senator Sinclair has stated on numerous occasions, and I think very powerfully, <coughs> Education got us 
and by that he means indigenous people, into this mess, and education will get us out of it. The funds are now flowing. Universities are increasingly funding community-led partnerships in which the resources go directly to the community organization rather than the academic researcher. This presents a real recentering of expertise. It's an acknowledgement that the knowledge holders are just as much, if not more, in the community than they are in the university. And it redirects funds, which provides a structured way of recognizing, remunerating, and respecting all that understanding, that specific place-based knowledge that community members have. And all of this naturally now leads to suggestions that universities need to decolonize and indigenize. There are profound differences in people's understandings of what this mean, means and how it's to be interpreted. For most of my indigenous colleagues, decolonization and indigenization are not metaphors. They are implementable, tangible, measurable structural changes in who controls and who owns, who administers and who legislates knowledge. <coughs> Decolonizing education is about substance, not symbol. It requires engaging with content and context, and it involves a true commitment to indigenous resurgence. As Dr. Shawneen Pete has written, the transformation of the academy by including indigenous knowledges and voices, critiques, scholars, students and materials, as well as the establishment of spaces that facilitate the ethical stewardship of plurality of indigenous knowledges and practices, so thoroughly as to constitute an essential element of the university. So let me wind up. Anthropologist Aaron Glass has noted that the use of the prefix re in words such as revitalization, rejuvenation, resurgence, or revival, points to the undoing of some past action or deed. In other words, if the world's indigenous peoples and cultures had not been somehow devitalized to begin with through colonization, there would be no need for those communities to revitalize today. The bitter irony of the current context is quite inescapable. Colonial governments such as Canada have for centuries marshaled their economic and military and administrative might to extinguish indigenous voices. Now in the 11th hour, Canada is looking to fund that which it set out to destroy. Many indigenous commentators point to the fact that benign neglect would have been much less damaging than two centuries of structural violence and erasure that now has been followed by a last minute U-turn. From 2005 to 2007, I worked on and off as a translator and an interpreter here in Nepal, first for the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and then later with the United Nations Mission in Nepal. The work in which we were engaged as interpreters and translators was odd, quite curious in fact, because it was both totally essential and totally invisible. Mark Polidotti, writing on why mistranslation matters in the New York Times just last week, described translation, and I quote, as the silent waiter of linguistic performance. It often gets noticed only when it knocks over the serving cart. This point was brought home to me by the head of the UN Translation Service in the UN headquarters in New York. When I visited him, he explained. He said, translation is like air. You only smell it when it's bad. <laughs> At its most conceptual level, translation is a form of transcoding or decoding, trying to create equivalencies when there often really aren't any. This evening, I've tried to translate something of that current moment in Canada through which I'm living regarding indigenous relations to you. You, an audience here in Nepal. So my only hope, remembering the words of that UN colleague, is that it didn't smell 
too bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, always a pleasure listening to you. The flawless uh, and mesmerizing presentation uh, combined with uh, <coughs> the uh, richness uh, of the subject. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost, I lost my voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll move straight into the uh, comments and questions and answers. Um, please, uh, you might want to comment as well. But try to uh, do try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, but questions will be uh, wanted more. Uh, please raise a hand, and when you ask your questions, please identify yourself. And, uh, please, uh, please, uh, I, I would recognize you. Please, uh, please wait for the microphone. So yes, Jen. The lecture is very precious and interesting one, but one thing in my mind is like that it is all development related with the economic process of development or not. Why should he never try to connect the economic development scenario with your presentation? Why it should? I am Toya uh, uh Thank you, Mark, for your comprehensive presentation. Uh, <clears throat> my question is about the use of uh, two languages uh, as official languages of Canada. And I will be interested to know what the status of other languages languages other than these two in Canada in, in, uh, in the light of some of them maybe qualifying for official status in some provinces and also in the use of the language in education. of the states and like Illinois, Iowa in the United States. And also in Canada, many names like Saskatchewan, if I'm correct, Ontario, they, they, they were not completely unused, I think they were used. Uh, I don't know why, why only British Columbia, for example. British Columbia is, uh, I mean, it makes no sense now, it's no longer British, it's part of Commonwealth of course, Canada, but uh, why, why British Columbia? That name should have been changed now, even now. And this process of uh, naming that used in all, even in India it was used, like uh, Lucknow, it was it, uh, in, in the LUCK, in Ottawa, I think that name is still there, but the spelling is given by the British. Even Kanpur, C A W N P R. Many of these names have been changed, like Chennai, replaced by Madras. Mm -hmm. So, this is going on in other parts of the world too. And what I have one question is: Has Canada signed ILO 169? If not, why not? <laughs> and, and another question is: uh, uh, Is this what you are saying part of? consensus in Canada, or is it, as you, you mentioned about Justin Trudeau, mm. so is it only the liberals who are in this, uh, who are following this, or even conservatives uh, are, are, are in agreement with this? Thank you. We'll take these three and then the next one. Well, thank you all for engaging uh, so directly with the substance of my talk. I'm, I'm very grateful to these questions. Uh, firstly, to the gentleman who asked the first question about economic development. Um, 
Thank you for raising that. I think I wasn't clear enough, actually, and I, I welcome your question. Economic development, certainly in terms of resources, uh, logging and the extraction of substrata resources, so oil and shale, gas from the land, is absolutely bound up with indigenous rights. And it is those treaties and the lack of treaties that has now compelled the federal government to engage with indigenous demands. In fact, that's probably why indigenous matters matter so much in Canada right now. It is the fact that for the federal government to get its pipeline through, it has to negotiate with 10 or 15 different indigenous groups, each of whom have an undisputed and uninterrupted claim to that territory. So you're quite right, the economic frame is that which sits behind a lot of this logic. And I wanted to explain perhaps some of the, the wider context, so thank you for making that point. Um, thank you to IAG for your question about uh, federal bilingualism and the two-language model. Um, it's a very, very pertinent and very current question you ask because uh, Justin Trudeau, the Liberal Prime Minister, has committed to seeing indigenous language legislation through in Canada. I've been part of some of those conversations, not with him, I should add, but with his uh, many, many delegates. And it's, it's troubling because Nobody knows how to proceed with this. This is not um, language policy like in Hawaii or in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where you have one dominant indigenous language, Hawaiian, Maori, where you can have clear legislation towards that. We have hundreds of languages, many of them in uh, very precarious positions, some of which don't have robust written traditions, and disagreements about spelling. So in the first instance, I think, what we do have are provincial legislation within the territories and provinces that make up Canada that are very strong. So in the north, Northwest Territories, and in some of the Inuit spaces, there's absolute legislation on the ground and in the province that mandates the use of indigenous languages. That doesn't necessarily transfer to the nation. So Canada in that way is a very effective federal system where jurisdiction stops at the federal province. There's a lot of discussion about education, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, schools in indigenous areas in particular, where there's a strong concentration, often teach the language as a subject, but not as the medium of instruction. There's a couple of schools now that are moving towards what they call language nests or full immersion. The idea being that you would study through your language to get to a point uh, where you could do all subjects in that language. That is what's provided in French, and the hope is, I think, for many communities, that that's where they'll get to as well. Um, lastly, I think uh, about that, Canadian indigenous communities look often to Hawaii, to New Zealand as inspiring models, but those models don't fit very well within the Canadian context. So I think we have to come up with better ways and better models for, um, for aspiring, so that we're modeling towards something that is deliverable rather than aspirational. So thank you for that question also. Um, Prakash Radzi, thank you for your many questions and also pointing out that this whole process of naming and renaming is uh, present across the world, particularly in spaces of colonization or post-colonial states. You mentioned India, of course. I'm delighted to hear that you think British Columbia is ludicrous also. I'll let them know that they have an ally <laughs> of some standing here in Nepal and I'm sure they'll be happy to know about that. Canada has a very bad history of implementing the very, uh, and ratifying the very processes that it of course is complicit in. So, let's talk about UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The four greatest offenders were of course the four nations that didn't sign. Canada, the US, and New Zealand, and Australia, because they have the most to lose. It's pretty easy for the UK to sign UNDRIP and ILO because they have old guilt but no contemporary guilt to worry about. But Canada is in much more complicit space. So I think you're quite right to, to raise that issue of ratification. Um, the last point you made is very profound, which is, a, is really, is what I presented a consensus now? Or is this a very partial view? And I think the answer is maybe twofold. I'm kind of the wrong person to ask because I've been dropped into this hotbed of indigenous resurgence in my job. So all around me, uh, this conversation is happening and it's much more advanced even than I presented it here. Having said that, 
my mother, who visits uh, Vancouver quite often, is always struck that you can't open a newspaper, you can't turn on the radio, without hearing something quite long and profound around indigenous relations. It is the story of Canada right now. Whether it be what's happened after 150 years and that whole sense of a moment of taking stock, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the federal government that changed with Trudeau's election. I must say Stephen Harper and his conservatives were, for many indigenous people in Canada, as it's been told to me, 10 years of darkness. The biggest question really is what will Trudeau do that's different? Some of my indigenous colleagues have said to me that they rather preferred uh, Stephen Harper, because at least with him, you know, it was, it was clear where the devil stood. But with Trudeau, he has a slippery tongue, he's a very compelling speaker. On the one hand, he talks about nation-to-nation -nation relations with indigenous people. On the other hand, he purchases pipelines and pushes them through native land. So it's not a consensus, but it's a growing understanding of the fact that indigenous people have part of the answer of what it means to be in Canada. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next we have Dan, Dan and then the gentleman behind him. Uh, I'll come back to you later. <laughs> Dan Hirsten from Denmark. Um, I want to thank you, Mark, for this fantastic talk. Also, um, it reflects the kind of uh, colonialization that we experience in Denmark as well, but we have still not recognized the colonization of Greenland, so I think there's a lot to take home also for non federalized modern democratizing states. So thanks for that. I want to ask you one question, and this is on, on the questions of democracy, or maybe re-democratization. I was feeling that maybe one could push the two slogans into a third one, right? Decolonize, indigenize, and re-democratize. Because we all know, and, and you as well, that indigenization, of course, does not speak to questions of power sharing, um, and, and of course of, of remaking the country <coughs> along lines that are more equitable. So I wanted to ask you, has redemocratization come up as a term in Canada, um, or is it something that's coming up another way you're expecting that, and is there also a lesson here um, for all of us that we can think about in terms of the path? Thank you. Uh, I will be happy. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Shambh Nama. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tumik, for very impressive uh, presentations. Uh, this topic was of special interest to me because I've also been living in Vancouver for the last 15 years. So, uh, Dr. Turin, uh, my question is uh, more around the internal colonialism. Um, we see a lot of, like you mentioned, we see a lot of efforts on the part of the uh, current liberal government in Canada to recognize the importance of uh, First Nation or Indigenous people. And so but there's a lot of respect I see on stuff with uh, uh, Gunnis I hear that there's a lot of uh, efforts in Canada to recognize the, the uh, indigenous people, you know, their movement, and just 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 show some respect and you know just so wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, now in, the, in the context of Nepal, um, you know, you know, I do not see the same level of I do not see the same level of conscious efforts on the highest part of the government or you could say uh, internal colonizers. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe they have a lot of things to lose, um, a lot of privileges that have been enjoying the last two, two centuries. So there's a little bit of a, a bit of a sort of a, it's not similar between Canada, because in Canada, there's a lot of conscious efforts on the, on the part of the highest government, and a lot of, on the, even, even, the, even the general public. Maybe they do not have, because all of them, most of them are also immigrants, so they do not have much to lose. But in the context of Nepal, probably among these internal colonizers, they have lots to lose. So it's, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it's more of a statement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Me? Yeah? No, no. Okay. <laughs> in front of that. <laughs> we'll come to you next round. Namaste. I'm Bihari Sesta. See, um, when we talk about colonialism, it's a very sensitive subject, a sensitive topic. Basically, when you look at instances like that of your country, Canada, America, New Zealand, or Australia, is the oppression by a set of new arrivals uh, on people who live there all the time, you know, indigenous people. So, when you refer to Nepal and talk about what you call internal colonialism, you know, as a matter of fact, it is the, the two words itself is an exercise in contradictions. You know? So therefore, I think you know, it has to be used very cautiously, especially 
in the context of a volatile in the situation that obtains in Nepal today in terms of ethnic relations. Mm. And secondly, so you give instances of name changes, and then I think you are trying to read a little bit too much, you know, in the in the in the in the process of names being changed. I'll give you an instance. Uh, something like 25 years ago, the place that we know as Naya Baneswar, New Baneswar today, mm. see, it used to be a desolate rice fields, you know, and then when the road was built, mm. the factory was established there for manufacturing electric bulbs. So, and then the name of the factory happened to be Sankar Chin, Sankar Bulb, you know. And the whole place was known as Sankar Bulb, you know, Sankar Chin, you know. <coughs> but then after, after this organization grew in that place, today nobody knows about Sankar Chin, it's Naya Baneswar, you know. Mm. So therefore, Names change in the course of, you know, what you say, in the course of human events, you know. Therefore, when you talk about, when you, when you, when you talk about colonialism and then associated with name change, I think it has to be, it has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for this second round, and I, I'm willing to keep going as long as you have the energy. Um, Dan, thank you for your point about Denmark. Yes, I mean, it's uh, every country has their own dark closet, and, and Greenland, of course, is yours. Um, Redemocratizing is not something I've heard, but I will maybe say two things in response. Um, I don't think the word democracy has enough pull for many people working in this hyper politicized space to be attractive enough. You know, decolonizing, indigenizing, those have a kind of a, a texture and an energy to them that democratizing doesn't. I was quite struck, if I may add, that during the last provincial and federal election, when I asked my indigenous friends and colleagues you know, what they voted or what they thought, they said, we're not voting. And I asked, why is that? And they said, we, we don't want to lend the state oh. any more credibility with our vote. Right? So it was a very conscious decision to object to the whole process of reinscribing the state and lending it power. I think Canadian democracy works in curious ways that I'm slowly becoming more uh, attuned to. I've never been somewhere that is so provincial, and I mean that in a really good way, but it is very local and very provincial and very municipal. It is striking to me to live in a country that has no federal department of education. Education is provincial mandate. There is no department of education in Ottawa. There's a few things that were federal, defense and indigenous affairs. Uh, so I think democratization works in very tangible and, and, and minuscule ways, notably um, becoming Canadian Nepali or Nepali Canadian, as many people do, uh, is, is not a contradictory feeling. You can exist in these two spaces at once. I should also note that earlier this year, Canada elected um, the first ever ethnically Tibetan um, municipal leader and minister of parliament uh, in the Toronto area. So there's a real emergence of kind of hyphenated identities. But I think re-democratizing maybe doesn't have quite the same traction but I appreciate uh, your, your question and your intervention there. Uh, Shambhu Lamati, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I think your point is absolutely central, that in a country of immigrants, things feel and work differently. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around becoming Canadian and what that means. Um, it was striking to me and to my daughter uh, and my son, when he first moved to Canada, the, the, the kind of all of the paraphernalia of Canadianness to me were very resemblant of Britishness. In fact, when we arrived in Canada and opened the Welcome to Canada booklet, there was a photo of the Queen. But in Canada, she's called Queen of Canada. I always thought of her as Queen of England, and Canada was like an addition <coughs> to her job. And my daughter Nina, who's somewhere at the back of the room, was looking at Canadian money for the first time, and she saw the Queen, and she said, hold on, this lady has a sister in England. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, it's the same lady. And she said, she has two jobs? <laughs> How do you begin to explain that to your then seven-year-old daughter? So in other words, that sense of arriving and becoming is something very different, I think, to Nepal, and I'm glad you mentioned it. I'd like to say, briefly something else and a bit more serious. 
which is compared to the States, uh, which many of you will know well as well. I think Canada deals with this differently for a fundamental reason. As one of my colleagues um, at the University of Western Ontario, the great anthropologist Regna Darnell said, in the US, the story of indigenous America, Native America, has been overwritten by the story of slavery. America's original sin, that of how it dealt with the indigenous people who were there, has become a tiny side story compared to Black Lives Matter, slavery, racism, structural violence against African Americans. And that has meant that they kind of, that's the story now of social justice in the States. Not exclusively, but mostly. In Canada, the story is still that of the indigenous encounter. And tragically and worryingly, most of the same socioeconomic indicators that you see in African American communities map onto indigenous communities in Canada. The same kinds of poverty, <coughs> exclusion, all those same issues uh, that we know so well. So I think you raise an important point uh, about that, and I think immigration is probably the central defining difference between the Canadian experience and the Nepali one. Uh, to Dr. Shrestha, thank you very much for your, your comments and also your provocations. Uh, you suggest in a way that the word internal and colonization are inherently contradictory and cannot be put in the same sentence. Um, I don't agree, I'm afraid. I don't believe that colonization has to be external. I believe there are ways of colonizing the body, the mind, and space that can be done entirely effectively by an internal elite. And in a way, because it's an internal elite, they're much harder to kick out. Um, when it comes to name changes, I take your point. Uh, thank you for your lovely story about that rice field and, and the Nyan Banis I, I should say some curious names in Nepal stick for some reason for many years. I lived right by Vatki Kopul. Did you get up on Vatki Kutiena? Are you the Sama Banako? Are you the Sama Vatki Kopul Bandarisa? So why, why is that not broken bridge, the one broken bridge in Nepal? I don't know. I, I should add, I am not an evangelist for name changes. I am noting uh, a federal, provincial, and local predisposition for this in Canada at the moment. It's happening with an alarming and exciting regularity. Uh, new places are being gifted indigenous names, old places are being given new indigenous names. So this reflects a moment in the national reckoning, and that's why I mention it, not because I think it's necessarily the only thing to do. Us, Stephen Killing here, and uh, Tom there, and uh, is that Victoria? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Thanks for your really interesting talk. Uh, my point is about not about name changing, but about new names. And again, it's not a question, but an issue that I think is really ripe for raising and investigating. Uh, and it's. I would like to, I haven't yet seen an investigation of how the names of the new six, seven hundred local government units of Nepal were arrived at, yeah? Uh, has there been any work on that? That's, that's a question. Uh, for instance, in the, in the district we're sitting in, we're in Lalitpur, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, why did the people of Chapagao and Techo agree to, agree to the name of Godavari Palik, uh, Nagapalika? That's one point, and uh, I'm happy to see that an area of uh, central eastern Lalitpur was named after uh, Tamang One-Eyed God. Uh, I can't quite pronounce it, it's something like Kom Jong Ro. Anybody know how it's pronounced? Anyway, I just want to raise those points. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Tom Robertson, director of Fulbright, but also a historian. Uh, thanks, Mark. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, my question is also, I guess, about naming, but maybe some of the other things you talked about. Um, it builds off of the earlier comment, and I completely understand what you just said. You're not an advocate of naming, but um, well, I can see some pretty complicated situations arising. Uh, what do you do if you have, so really the question is how do people decide on what other names get assigned to a particular place or something else? 
What happens if two groups or many groups mm -hmm. claim the same place? What happens, uh, so that's a, that's a question about mixture. There's also a question about historical change. So what happens if it's a place that has changed hands multiple times and the most recent group that was a non-external co uh, colonial, what happens if the most recent group is actually themselves settler colonists mm -hmm. in that area? Um, so they have violently taken over, um, but they count as indigenous as well. So I can, I can see some pretty complicated mm -hmm. situations. So how do people make the decision? That last case would be a case where, in an effort to remember, you are actually erasing other people's histories. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tori Dalzell, ethnomusicologist and independent researcher. Um, so you spoke a little bit about decolonization in terms of university partnerships with research and such. And so out of curiosity, I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion, and this is more like a department level, about decolonization in pedagogy and like teaching. And I asked this question realizing that this can't necessarily <laughs> come as like university policy, policy like university wide, but these things often happen within departments just because of um, particular histories that a discipline might have with research. So I'm curious about conversations, not just content wise, but also like how how to teach, um, and so and then connecting that to your previous comment concerning colonization or decolonizing the mind. Um, if you could just uh, maybe talk a little bit about that. Thank you again for another great crop of, uh, of points and questions. Uh, Steve, to your point, I'd love to know that too. Uh, how were those names looked at? Was there a process of consultation, or was it uh, sort of much more just? central decision-making body that decided uh, that this is what it was going to be. I do think in in these moments of naming, renaming, restructuring, you know, there are opportunities for building relations and for consulting in ways that haven't been done before. If relations haven't been great, a new federal structure, a new realignment provides an opportunity for people to go and say, well, we haven't been here before much, but we'd like to hear what do you think. So. Uh, I do think that's a great opportunity. I wonder whether those the, the provinces, the numbers will stick, or whether we're going to see uh, some pushback against that or other forms of more culturally rooted names. I realize the complexity full well, so I don't think it's uh, in any way easy. But there is something pleasingly comforting and also strangely vacuous about calling a province number one. Um, Tom, your question, of course, comes also in the same vein. You're absolutely right. This is incredibly complex. And your last point uh, is very well taken, that in an effort to remake, in a way, another person's history can be erased. What would I say about this? Well, firstly, when UBC decided to rename two of its student residences, which were previously called, I think, Haida and Nutka, both anthropological classifications done without consultation, uh, rather external and um, instrumentalized sounding names, through consultation with Musqueam. Musqueam donated, gifted two names, Hadassam and Kolachan, both of them written in the International Phonetic Alphabet. There was an absolute uproar within the central planning uh, unit at UBC, who immediately said, those are impossible to pronounce, they're even harder to write, how on earth will pizza delivery guys know where to <laughs> That was the official response, right? And so I think part of it is about educating people to try and pronounce things they haven't pronounced before. Right? And there's that sensitivity to it. I do believe that Cana there's a Canadian bilingual mindset, that appreciation that there is more than one language does help open the envelope of possibility there a little bit. You're quite right that many places have overlapping claims, and particularly in urban sites like Vancouver. This is why the city of Vancouver chose that that central plaza that I mentioned briefly and showed a very quick slide of has been gifted three indigenous names from each of the three local host communities. This is not to uplift one over others, but to say we recognize 
that this place is salient for all these people. Nobody expects, I don't think, that next Tuesday, young people in are going to start using the Musqueam, Squamish, or Slavertooth word, but more that that place then becomes associated with the site of learning and remembrance, which it was before it became you know, a, a party palace or a museum. But your point also is well taken, that there are competing claims on names. Uh, I live in a part of Vancouver called Kitsilano, and Kitsilano derives its name from Katsalano, the great culture hero and warrior. I haven't met an indigenous group in the lower mainland of Vancouver who don't claim Katsalano as theirs. Everybody claims Katsalano as theirs. So if everybody claims Katsalano, who really was Katsalano yet? I think in that sense of accommodation and relationship, everybody has a little bit of it. There are uncomfortable histories in indigenous culture too. There are histories of slavery, of exploitation, of violence, of extermination. I think all of this is really about making those less known <coughs> histories explicit, having the conversation and leading, therefore, to a deeper understanding. Nobody's saying that one is better than the other, but that form of overwriting history, I think, has become intolerable to many indigenous people and also many young people who want to know what that place was called before it was Vancouver. Mm. Uh, Tori, thank you for your question. Um, it's very welcome and very necessary. Indigenizing pedagogy is something that uh, the unit that I'm in and teaching is, is quite involved in, but it's by no means the only conversation. It's happening all over Canada. It takes many forms. It takes the form of looking critically at your syllabus and wondering whether you just have mostly dead, mostly white, mostly old men telling you in your syllabus who those people were, or whether you found a way to include local voices in that work as well. There's a really interesting movement right now across Canada to hire more indigenous scholars into university positions. But there's been an interesting pushback as well in two ways. Firstly, many of those people, those talented upcoming indigenous scholars, are being hired before they finish their PhD. They're being hired at a time when they really need to focus on their research, but what they're being hired to do is to help a university indigenize itself. And they give those scholars enormous service loads, put them on every single committee so they can say, oh, we have a female indigenous scholar on this committee, thereby making it structurally impossible for them to complete their research and get published. So what we found in this whole process of indigenizing pedagogy as well, sometimes it's kind of useful to have non-indigenous scholars playing the role of explaining why all this matters to other non-indigenous students. And in my unit, I am one of three non-indigenous teachers, instructors, who get a fair amount of those young Canadian and international students saying, what's my role? How do I do this right? How can I be effective? I don't know when I can speak. I don't understand what my role is. So there's a sense of really finding a way to uplift indigenous scholars to do the research they need to do to forward the conversation and take it to the next level. And that involves rethinking syllabi, and it also involves rethinking how we teach. There's a great movement now to do what they call land-based education, right? um, community-based, land-based teaching. So that's taking students out of the classroom, out of the nine to five, 13 week terms, and going, if invited, to indigenous spaces and working with elders to do work on the land. It's much more embodied, it's much more experiential, it's much more practical. I've had the privilege of doing that for three summers now with my students, indigenous and not. So I think that's what indigenous uh, pedagogy, decolonized pedagogy, is beginning to look like. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll go for the last round of uh, questions. We have Tashi here, the gentleman there, and Francis at the back. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Mark. Uh, uh, my name is Tashi. I, uh, so, once in time, I will ask only one question. Uh, it's more to do with our own experiences also and try to relate to it can be in this moment. I think uh, considering our own indigenous leaders who are also co-opted by the various political parties, right? So, how do you see the situation in Canada in, in, in regard to the indigenous movement and its sustainability? So, how do they make the indigenous movement sustainable? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Pratik, and my question is based on uh, Dr. Sister's remarks. Uh, 
who just said that uh, decolonization movement as just a pinch of salt and just move on. So my question is, how important is indigenous toponym, especially in name place to scientific knowledge, especially to bioculture uh, conservation and ethnoecology and climate change issues? Mm -hmm. Francis. Francis. Um, first, thank you, Mark, for a really interesting presentation. And I, as a Canadian, learned a lot. Um, can I make one comment about, or a couple of comments? Thank you for also mentioning Nunavut, which is the new territory in Canada, uh, where uh, Inuktitut, the language of the Inuit people, uh, once called Eskimos, is a um, territorial language. Um, one of the things, one of your comments about um, how provincial Canada is, as a small example, in the province that I come from in Alberta, that's right next to, uh, should be renamed British Columbia, um, there are a few, there's several judges who are under the um, provincial um, court, and they've been working with some of the indigenous communities to start taking recognition of the indigenous processes a step further by um, working with elders um, such that when there's an indigenous person convicted of a crime, they don't go through the usual court process, they go through sentencing circles where they sit with the elders um, in a circle to discuss what kinds of reparations should be done for the, um, uh, for the, the crime. So that's another step that's going a little bit further in one small location. Thank you, and thanks for a great presentation. Uh, thank you all for these uh, this last round of questions and comments. Um, so briefly, uh, Tashi, thank you very much for, for your question. Um, it's striking that sort of indigenous movements seem to be structured quite differently in Canada. I think part of that is based on locality. Um, and partly about, about maybe a set of different issues that on the one hand you have communities who want to be visible to the state, on the other hand what they really want is actually sovereignty. And this is where I come back to this idea that decolonization is not a metaphor, it's actually a practice. Um, there is no federal Janadaki political party in Canada. <laughs> Yet every federal party is now incumbent to engage with indigenous people. And interestingly, and I think quite commendably, the Trudeau government has appointed indigenous ministers, but not given them the indigenous portfolio. Right? That would have been too easy and also, I think, too complex and complicit. So our federal minister of justice and also the attorney general of Canada is a dynamic indigenous leader, a lawyer from the Vancouver area, Jody Wilson, uh, Wilson Raybull. So there's a realization, I think, that part of what this is about is not uh, creating parallel power structures at the federal level, but rather creating uh, sustainable autonomy and sovereignty at the local level. Many First Nations communities run their own health care, they run their own education, and they have their own police forces. Right? Others are under provincial uh, jurisdiction. So the, the sort of whole issue of sustainability and movement, I think, is, is different to Nepal, but notably uh, interesting also. Now, thank you, Pradeep, for your question. I think you, you get at a very complex and, and powerful topic, which is that of the link between biodiversity and cultural diversity. One of the people who founded that way of thinking, at least, I think, in the global north, by the name of Louisa Mafti, mm -hmm. who wrote a powerful book called Biocultural Diversity, lives just, uh, just off Vancouver Island. And this whole sense of um, places and toponyms and place names and plants having resonance and being important is, is very central to many indigenous ways. I will say, however, my indigenous colleagues get kind of frustrated when they see in the newspaper on the radio, you know, amazing miracle drug, whatever, discovered in indigenous territory. Because they would say, and I think quite rightly so, that you know, Western science is only now discovering yep. that which they've known for a rather long time. But there's a very powerful link between um, place-based knowledge, um, medicinal plants, traditional foods, and understandings of space. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 
Um, Francis, thank you for, for your comment and, and bringing once again Nunavut and some of these, these very progressive justice systems uh, into, into view. I think something that we've been hearing a lot of in Canada is restorative justice and finding ways to not incarcerate people, but rather bring them back into community and, and get, get, uh, get young people, and wherever they come from, indigenous or not, thinking about how they can participate in community. Uh, I, I was struck by the fact when I first moved to Canada that community was probably one of the most used words. I just never heard it said so often. And now I find myself saying it as well. So perhaps in a funny little way, I'm becoming a little bit Canadian. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, the, the very few people uh, who have left the room, the rate of attrition being so low, it demonstrates how, how wonderful it was. Uh, but I just want to plug another talk that we're having uh, later this week. Uh, it happens to be uh, British Columbia Week. We have uh, Bishop Pandey from the British Columbia Institute of Technology, who's going to talk about disasters, development, and building codes on Thursday, the 2nd. Uh, you will be getting the notice by the time you reach home. So I hope we can see you uh, that day. He's going to talk about earthquakes and building codes and the interface uh, of engineers with the society. But thank you once again, Mark. It has been wonderful to host you. Thank you once again for coming here. And a small token of... Uh, Thank you.